All right, so we're, we're, we're here to talk about P3. So uh, first off, um, who here uh, knows anything about P3 or has involved, been involved in P3? So three people? Okay, no? Okay. And who here knows about Arup? Who Arup is? Okay, so there's a couple of people that aren't familiar with Arup. So we're gonna do a uh, selfish plug. I'm gonna tell you in probably 30 seconds or 45 seconds about Arup. Um, and because uh, that, that'll give you a little bit of background into, into the work we do as well. The, uh, this might seem like an odd picture, but this is actually the, the back of Ov Arup, the, the founder of the firm. Uh, it's an iconic picture in our firm and uh, even outside the firm. Um, the firm was started in 1946 by Sir Ov Arup. He was a gifted engineer and philosopher. In fact, there are some people that say he was very likely the most gifted engineer of the last century, of the, of the 20th century. We are an independent firm of designers and uh, planners, engineers, consultants, technical specialists. We have uh, over 90 disciplines um, uh, in our firm, represented in, in our firm. Uh, we're across the globe. We're present in uh, roughly 35 countries with about 14,000 people. And we're going to just show you very quickly one project out of each continent, just to kind of give you a sense of the magnitude of, of Arab. Okay. All right. So globally around the world, we have, for starting off in Australia. And just to, to, to add to that, by the way, these are not necessarily projects that Arup has done as a whole. We participated in some way, shape, or form, okay? Either structural engineering or some other discipline or a combination of disciplines, okay? Yeah. So first we have Australia. Now we have California, which is the Apple Park. This is in London, UK, the Shard. This is in South Africa, the Mauritius uh, Commercial Bank. Singapore, Marina Bay Sands. This one's in Brazil, so <laughs> I'll let Fernando take over how to pronounce this. This one. is this is Catedral de Brasilia. So this is a, this is a cathedral in the cap in the capital of Brazil. Since Consul 2018 is in Tennessee, we thought we'd find a project that's local to here. This is the IMAX 3D theater, which is an extension of the Tennessee uh, Aquarium. And lastly, this is a local project to us back in our home, Toronto, the East Rail Maintenance Facility. It's about an hour, two hours away outside of Toronto. Um, what this project we did on it was mainly IT comms and security systems, so ranging from structured cabling system, the Wi-Fi system, public address, access control, video surveillance, we did all that. So on to, so enough about Arup and what we've done, uh, on to what we're, what we're going to talk about. So uh, uh, apparently Ray wants us to tell you a little bit about us and have our mugshot on the <laughs> presentation, so we will have that on the slide. Um, we uh, are going to talk about some P3 stats and facts in the U.S. We're going to define what a P3 project is for those of you that aren't familiar with P3 projects. Um, we're going to talk about stakeholder hierarchy. Uh, security implications, obviously, I mean, that's the main piece is that we want to talk about. Um, we, we want to talk about the SOR, the Statement of Requirements. We're going to talk about cyber. And then how to protect ourselves as consultants from, um, I don't want to go negative right away, but <laughs> let's say from some of the difficulties that you might encounter in P3, okay? Um, so before we even get onto that, just so that we're on the, on, the, on the same page, P3, or some people refer to it as a PPP, is a public-private partnership, okay? The SOR, most of you should know this, or all of you should know this, that's a statement of requirements. The DJV is a design joint venture. Now, does everybody know what a joint venture is here? Yes? Okay. And then uh, the CJV, the construction joint venture, uh, ONMJV, so that's your operations and maintenance joint, uh, joint venture. Project Co or DB Co is the term that's generally used to kind of encompass all of that. So the DJV, the CJV, and the ONMJV kind of fall under this uh, uh, organization that is roughly known as Project Co or DB Co. Um, so that includes the management, the CJV, DJV, the financial side as well. And then last, Variation Directive. This is an interesting thing. Um, variation Directive is a 
it's it's a vehicle. It's a it's a way for the governing or the, the 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 government, the public side of this partnership, to effectively force the project co to do something even before we may agree on the financial terms. Okay, so if there's a change, for example, that they want and and they don't want to kind of delay the project, they can effectively force us to start designing and even start building that change before the public-private partnership agrees on the financial terms of that change. So that's a um, it's a pain in the rear end. That's what that is. Okay. All right. So who are we? Uh, I'll start with me very quickly. Uh, so I work for Arup, obviously. I'm a senior uh, ICT and security systems consultant at Arup. I've got over 20 years experience in the technology field. Um, and um, I've done projects in all, these, uh, on, on, in all these verticals, aviation, property, sports venues, rail, education, healthcare. Although these days I'm focusing on the top two, aviation and property. So uh, just like Fernando, I work right beside him. Uh, over four years of experience. Um, only experience that I don't really have on my plate right now is healthcare, but just like Fernando, I'm working primarily on aviation and property. So, are there P3 projects here in the US? Yes? And anybody think no? Okay. The answer is definitely yes. There are P3 projects in the US. Um, so, how many? That's a interesting Does, does anybody have a sense of, say, say this year, we're already in November, any sense of how many active P3 projects are right now in the US? Can I ask a question? Yes. Does an ILPD project count as P3? Or is that distinctive enough to be something different? Um, so a P3, we're going to define what P3 is so that we're all on the same page. We're gonna, we, we've got some slides, but a P3 is when the, a public entity uh, either uh, an agency of a government, be it uh, a federal government, a state, or in our case, a provincial government, or even city, although city generally does not have the financial clout to handle a P3, because a P3 generally is a, is, a, is, a, is a project that involves many millions of dollars, okay? Uh, so when those two parties, the public sector and the private sector come together um, uh, to put through a project, Th that, that is the definition of a, of a P3, right? So, um, and, and I, we'll, we'll go through the entire thing. We'll explain P3. So if some, somebody who's got experience with P3 will know what I'm talking about. Those of you that may not will get, will kind of understand what's going on, okay? Philip, take, take that one. Yeah, so back in 2012, I mean, it, it's getting there, not really. 15 projects. You ramp your way up to 2017, 92 projects. When we last checked, back in October, about 87 projects. You project that by the end of 2018, roughly 107 projects. The trend just keeps going up. Now, that's, this is just the US. We already know that within Canada, it's already booming. So it's only going to get closer and closer to Canada. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Why don't you? Just say real loud. Yeah. Where, where, did the, where, did, where did the numbers go? This came from a website off Google. Um, I forgot what the website is, but it's pretty much a database of all the projects that are currently within the U.S. That in, are P3. in fact, they are, they, the, this website, if, if you did a search on Google for P3 projects in the U.S., you'll find this website that actually has all P3 uh, projects globally. You can actually search by country. Right? And then if you're a member, if you're willing to pay a um, significant amount of m money, you, you actually get the names of all the projects and what they are, all the, all the details, the value of each project and so on. Okay. In like California, they were doing all the courthouses that were P3. Would that be grouped as one project or all courthouses? Or? So it depends. If it falls under one contract, okay. multiple venues, one contract, it's, it's, then it's one P3 project. Okay. It should be one P3 project, yeah. Is the DBFM any different than the P3? We're going to get to that. That's actually a, a version. There's actually multiple versions of P3s, but you're, yes, you're jumping a little bit ahead. That's actually one of the slides that's, that's, uh, that's coming up. Okay. We already kind of went through the trend. Now you kind of see here, according to AIG, seems to be a big issue. We see that it is the world's largest emerging P3 market. But why? <laughs> sorry, somebody said? Faster. Fast, sorry? Faster. 
Yes, and and f like frankly, and like, you know, we don't want to make light of situation. We're Canadian, but <laughs> your your infrastructure is in bad shape, and I think this is known amongst yourselves as well that your infrastructure is in bad shape, and of course that that costs a lot of money, right, to fix. Yeah. So, and what Fernando just said is actually supported, according to Mark Ananoff, infrastructure needs three point six trillion dollars by twenty twenty. Even the American Society of Civil Engineers rated it a D plus in terms of the infrastructure in the U.S. Three point six trillion dollars is doesn't exactly like it doesn't, it's, it. It's not easy to come by, right? So the government need, needs to do something. Governments in general, not just in the U.S., but need to do something to be able to, in some way, afford this or or mortgage it out almost. Okay, so that's where the P three um, procurement method comes in. So let's get to the explanation of what a P3 is. Philip? There's a definition right there, but just to clarify it, P3, when the public sector has a need, that need needs to be accomplished some way or another, right? And they have a sniffing cost to this need. So in order to get rid of that cost through the government funding, they transfer over that into the private sector. This is where that partnership comes into play. So there's a lot of shift in who pays for it, who takes on the risk, and that is where this partnership lies, and we're gonna explain that further down the road. Yeah. So as I mentioned earlier, these, this is not for, these, like this, this procurement method is not for small projects. We're, talk, we're not talking about you know, $100,000 or something, or even a million dollars, frankly. I'd, I'd be surprised if you find a P3 for less than the tens of millions, but typically it tends to be more in the hundreds of millions and even, even over a billion dollars, okay? So these are very, very large, large projects. Um, the time span is another factor. So these are projects that go on for a long, for a long time. Uh, the design alone could go on for a couple of years. Uh, there's some mm, interesting things that go on during a dime, that time span, which, which we'll get into, but um, then depending on the type of contract, which uh, you've alluded to already, to write the DBFM, and, I'll, and we'll get into that, um, the entire project cycle actually can end up being in over 30 uh, years. Welcome. I was saying that we have, we're missing one person, <laughs> and there you are. <laughs> So what kind of projects would we expect P3 to be uh, a solution for, the, uh, the, for, the, for that need, for the, for the government need, right? There's the need and then there's also the financial aspect of it, right? So infrastructure projects, some types of military projects, education, transportation, social housing, broadband and delivery and public service and healthcare, and, and more, more in Canada, okay? Because most, yes, I added the A because, you know, everybody thinks we say that. And you know, everybody thinks we also say a boot, but we don't. It's about, okay? Say so, hi. yeah. <laughs> so, but, but, so, the, so I would say in Canada, the, 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 um, the key projects that I would say are, are very common in, in, in Canada for P3s are, are infrastructure, transportation, and healthcare. Uh, those are the key projects. Uh, project types in Canada. Of course, here in the U.S., because I, I, I'm not an expert, but I believe here most of your hospitals, or probably a significant number of hospitals, are probably private. They're not government-owned, per se. So you're not going to find a P3. I mean, if the hospital's already private, or if it's going to be private, then there is no public side to it, right? So to understand a little bit of what a P3 project is, maybe we should talk about what a project that is not a P3. So the very common design, bid, build, right? So at some point, somebody figures out that there's a need for something. So whether it's a new subway line or whatever, right? Some sort of big project, there's a need. So somebody then puts a business case together. And at some point, the, 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 the public entity will put out an RFP or RFQ for an engineering and architectural team. That will be the, the, the owner's rep effectively, right? And they will actually put together a, um, a, a basic design to show intent, right? So 
in, in a design bid build, th that does not happen, right? Because once, when, when, when a business case is put together and the, and the, gov the, the government uh, hires this engineering team, they, they are the owner's rep, but they're also going to finish the design all the way through, right? Unlike a P3. And once we get to the, to the P3, we'll, we'll, we'll see the difference. So once the drawings are done, it goes out to bid to multiple contractors, two, three, four, whatever the number of contractors, and eventually the winning bidder will build out that, that project, right? In a P3, it's actually quite a bit different. There's few similarities, but it's quite different. So again, the, the, the beginning is the same. There's a need, there's a business case, um, and then the owner's engineering team and architectural team puts together an, an SOR, a statement of requirements, which, is, which has that basic design. And then a request for, cal for qualifications is put out. So this is, this is literally to, to find uh, teams that have the experience and the financial clout, which there aren't many, right, that can actually go through with this. And then, so then that list is narrowed. And in Canada, typically, it narrows down to two or three bidders only, okay? Uh, then each one of those three teams or two or three teams will start putting their response together. Their response involves not just the financial side, how much money is it going to cost, because everything, you know, a lot of it has to do with how much money is it going to cost, right? But they're also going to put together a design, typically around 30% design. Right? So if you consider 100% is your finished design ready for construction. So, so they'll put together a design that's roughly about 30% of that. It gives the contractor a sense of what the architect and the engineers are thinking. And it also gives the owner, the eventual owner, the government, an idea whether, whether it's going to meet the SOR requirements. Right. <clears throat> so at some point, a preferred proponent, that's a proper term, at least in Canada, I don't know if in the US it's termed as that, but the preferred proponent is, the, is determined. So the government figures out along with their um, uh, engineering team, right, because there's two engineering teams, right, there's the owner engineering team and then there's the engineering team that's in each one of the three bidders, right. So that engineering team with the government uh, owner, the ultimate owner, will evaluate the three bids and the one that they like the best is, will become known as the the preferred proponent. And then they enter into negotiations. The price that was put forward and the design that was put forward is, is, is up for negotiation. If the government is uh, interested in some changes and that proponent will accept them, then cool. Eventually, they sign a contract, right? So, um, uh, great. My remote has stopped working. <clears throat> there we go. So they'll, they'll, they'll sign a contract and immediately the, 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 the design will progress beyond the 30%. And guess what? Construction starts right now. Is the proponent typically the low bidder or is everything factored in? Everything is factored in, but certainly there's no question. I mean, money comes into play, like big time, right? Yeah. So if you didn't catch that, so construction starts right now. The design is only at 30%. And as soon as the, 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 the financial close happens, as soon as the, the, the contract is done, they're off to that property and they're going to start digging. So what, the implications of that are obvious, right? As the architects and engineers are working through continuing the design, if the architecture changes and the foundation's already in, right? I mean, it has less impact or no impact on the security side, but to give you an idea, uh, as we start to, go, to get through construction and, and some changes start to happen because either the architect's starting to, to change some things or the government has said, well, we actually don't want this wing of the building that way, we want it that way, change the foundations, we're already spending more money than we, than, than, than we aimed for, right? Because we've, we already have foundations down, but now we've got to change them, right? So that kind of gives you a little bit of a difference between the two. The key takeaway is that two... Um, the two engineering and architectural teams, right? There's one that's on the owner side, on the government side, and the other one that is on the contractor side, right? So one is the compliance engineer to make sure that the requirements of the SOR are met, and the other one is effectively trying to defend our design if we're the, the, the project co, right? And making sure that we don't spend any more than what we, that w than what we want to, right? Because otherwise we're gonna lose money, which is, just, it happens all the time. <laughs> and we'll describe that in a more yes. diagrammatic form yeah. afterwards. So, yeah. yeah. Yes. I know one thing is that 
So they realized the other two teams that were pricing it get a stipend. Correct. That's included Absolutely. in the final pr each of them final yes. pricing. So yes. that it's not it's yes. not it's not profitable, so, but yeah. at least they don't. Yeah, it covers eat part. It, of, it covers part of the cost. Yes. So all three teams get a, a certain amount of money to prepare their 30% bid design. Yes. So to answer your question about DBFM, certainly DBFM, it, so design, build, maintain, finance, DBFM. That is the most common P3, at least in Canada. But all of these are versions of P3, right? Design, build, design, build, maintain. Design, build, maintain, finance, as I said. Design, build, maintain, finance, and operate. So in the operate, for, as an example, if you have like a rail line, right? the operate would, would mean they will be running the trains on behalf of the city or the, the government body, right? And then the last one, design, build, maintain, finance, operate, and own. So each one of these has a certain risk depending on, you know, um, the contract type and, 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 and some of the requirements. Um, but for example, uh, this life cycle risk in the maintain. So that means if over the 30 year, 25 or 30 year maintenance contract, if some of the equipment fails, guess what? They're on the hook for it, right? Because the building has to function. That facility has, has to function, right? Beg your pardon? You get back like new. That's right, that's right. And by the, by the time, uh, to, to take your point again, by the time the contract's done, the 30 year contract, that whole facility is given to the government and it has to be in functioning order. It has to be. Yeah. Philip, you want to take that? Yeah. So we're doing P3 projects, so what are some of the pros? Well, because a P3 project usually expands over a 25, 30 years lifespan, the public sector spreads out the cost. Virtually all the income goes towards the private sector and it's guaranteed based on the contract. There's this sense of one team, which is the public partnership that we have with the private. Now, asset management is one crucial thing of the pro because a lot of the public sector, they don't want to deal with the maintenance and the operations throughout the entire life cycle. So they transfer all that over to a private sector and say, I need you guys to do all this. I just want you guys to build it for me. You guys maintain it. You guys operate it. And then hands off after that. And we don't really care how you do it. Just do it. Um, so the, the, the only other thing, just again to make clear, is so if the value of this project, so for example, Philip and I worked on a project that was almost a billion dollars Canadian value. So that's about roughly three dollars American. So, um, so almost a billion dollars Canadian, but the construction cost was about 400 million dollars. So the balance of it is effectively the operation and maintenance of that facility. Of course, the government of, well, the government that, w that is responsible for that, for that P3 project at the end of the project, at the end of the construction, didn't just hand over $400 million or even, you know, almost a billion. It's actually spread over the 30 years. It's like a mortgage, right? So it's a, it's a way for the government to not cough up so much money today, but just pay it off as kind of like a mortgage. Of course, there's cons. Limited design freedom. So because there is an SOR involved in this, the consultants, designers, engineers, they obviously have to follow the requirements of this SOR giving you a limited restriction on how you can design something, what can you use to design it, what product you're gonna use, and which leads down to a lot of other limited issues here, which opportunity for paid changes. A lot of the requirements are already listed in your SOR, so if you're gonna say, I need something to be changed, well, no. It's already listed in the SOR that you need to be able to provide us this, this, and this. So you better do it, and it's not a change because you didn't follow the SOR properly or it was missed. So it goes into the reading of the SOR and the arguments that start to ensue. And that's just the reality of it, right? Because um, just like reading any other document, I have my interpretation of it. And if I'm financially savvy, I'm going to read it the way I want it to be read. And of course, the government's going to want to read it the way they want it to be, to be read. Uh, and of course, that, that's, that starts to become a problem. So that goes to the clarity of the SOR. If whoever wrote the SOR, that, or, that originating architectural engineering team, if they did like a really, really, really amazing job, which by the way, that doesn't happen very often, um, but if they did a really, really good job, you'd lessen that uh, significantly, right? And limited large project players. You have these 
big, giant construction companies out there. And there's only a limited amount of them that would actually want to take on such a huge project because of such liabilities in there. Yeah. Relationships sour. They sour. Originally, we say there is a partnership here. We're one team. That's all great at the very beginning until issues start coming up. And then what? Relationships are going to sour. I was just on that note. I was involved in the project many years ago. And in, the, in one of the first meetings that we had, they, were, like, they had a banner on the wall and everybody signed the banner. The banner said something like, you know, one team for the project or whatever, something along those lines. In no time, exactly, kumbaya. In no time, things went south. Yeah. <laughs> and then within the design team, the CJV, DJV, your contractors, those relationships are going to sour as well, eventually. You have them all working together, trying to design it and construct it. But what happens when something goes wrong with the design versus they did some shortcuts on site and they start pointing fingers? Who was wrong? Your, your design was wrong? Or did you guys skip steps, take shortcuts on site? Who did what wrong? Fingers are going to start pointing. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about responsibilities um, or the, the, the risks, I, sh I should say. Who owns risk? and the two different types of projects, right? On the one on the left, the design bid build. The public sector typically holds the risk for the design, the financing, the facility management, the life cycle of the, of the facility, uh, the facility availability, performance, and asset value. So typically they hold that risk if it's a design bid build because once the construction's done, the contractor hands over the facility and says, it's yours, here's the key, right? So they own it. So that means all of those risks belong with the public sector. On the private sector side, only really the construction, right? During the construction, the risk of, for that construction is on the, on the, on the uh, private sector's hands, okay? Now you switch over into the P3. All that is shifted over onto the private sector. Now what does that mean? This is a lower risk now to the public sector because they, let's say for example, they don't have the expertise to get it done. So what do you do? You find someone who has the expertise to get it done. So they shift all that over onto the private sector, hire individuals who have that type of knowledge, that type of skill set to get it done. Now that's a higher risk now to the private sector because they're dependent on to get this done because they're the SME on, on everything that they need to accomplish. If they can't get it done, then what happens? So that risk is on the private sector. So the, the performance specifications here, just to clarify again, that, that's your SOR. That's the statement of requirements. So because that SOR is prepared by the public sector's engineering and architectural team, of course they, they own the risk for those specs, right? So if the specs are really, really poorly uh, done, and I've seen a few, um, then they own the risk to that, right? Because uh, if then the project co is trying to build something, you know, if they're trying to build a room and the lighting isn't described, well, somebody is on the hook for lighting that isn't properly described or, or missed or something, right? A couple of other things as yeah. well. Now, when we get to this, shifting from the mindset of a design bid build into a P3, can you ask yourself who's in charge? So, from some, so take that, just hold that thought for a second. I would say the majority of the information from this point onwards that we're going to talk about are from the perspective of Project Co, rather than the architectural engineering team that's, that's um, representing the ultimate owner, right? So most of the material that we're going to talk about going forward has to be, it will be from the perspective of, of Project Co. So Philip's question in terms of who's in charge is from that perspective, right? So you have this team which is you know, architects, engineers, the, the constructors, their, sub, their subcontractors. So who's in charge? And a, a lot of the times when you think about a traditional design bid build, as a security consultant, you have the opportunity there to talk to the client. You have the opportunity there to talk to your integrator, your contractor, your manufacturers, figure out what type of product you want, help drive the design towards the ultimate solution. It's very more direct and you have more freedom to be able to make that happen. So do you still have that much freedom when you're working on a P3? The answer is no. You're part of a team. Contractor is your friend. <laughs> Sorry, I laugh because eventually that deteriorates, but you know. <laughs> but so the yeah. answer is? 
not you, not us, not the consultants. We're not in charge. Okay. That's so who is in charge, right? If we're not in charge, who's in charge? Let's take a look. Now, what Fernando was mentioning earlier, you have the public sector and then you have the owner's rep. Now, as an engineer, as a consultant, it's easy that you can be on this side of the project, but we're gonna be talking about the other side, the project co side. At the very bottom on the left, you see the designers and the consultants, which is where we're gonna lie. And then let's say you wanna to talk to your security contractor, your integrator. What do you have to do now? <laughs> talk to your architect, talk to CJV, and then it filters down to your electrical contractor, and then it filters down to eventually to the security contractor. Just to get a clear clarification on a question. Now, it doesn't mean that we can't have a meeting with them. It just means that chances are the people in the middle are going to want to be there too, right? So we can ask some questions to them. We can coordinate with them. They are our friend, right? But it's a somewhat uh, difficult relationship to some extent, right? Because now you have so many other stakeholders that are involved. You ask a simple question. You want your design to be driven in a certain way. Well, there are a lot of other stakeholders that are in the game now that might not necessarily agree with what you want. Same thing when you're trying to talk to the client. They're all the way up there. You have to go through the architects, the CJV, the project sponsor, and then through the compliance, the owner's rep, before you even can get to the owner themselves. Philip and I have been in meetings where somebody from the government is present, even somebody who is technically capable, who has the knowledge that can answer questions, and for, the mo for most, if not all of the meeting, they don't say a word. It's, the, it's their compliance engineer and architect who speak on their behalf. And sometimes they, go, they whisper to each other because you know, they want to confer. Um, but generally speaking, even, on, even somebody from the government side who might have the technical knowledge and is present in the meeting, chances are they're not going to say much. Chances are. And it's one of the worst things is you're sitting in a meeting with everyone there. People who are decision makers are there. You can ask them right there. They answered it to you verbally, but it still has to go through all the chains officially before you can actually do anything on it. And, and in fact, I'll even take it a step further. The minutes, in, at least in the projects up in Ontario, most of the projects that we've done are in Ontario, but we've done some across Canada as well. The minutes from those meetings mean nothing. Literally, if they say, we agree for you to wallpaper this room, in six months, even though it's minuted, they might say, yeah, but the minutes don't mean anything because if in the contract it said, thou shall paint it, tough luck. The process is, oh, you want a wallpaper, but in the SOR, it says paint. So now you, Mr. Government or Miss Government, need to change the SOR, need to make a, a change to that document and tell us in writing, a change to the document that we can wallpaper it. Otherwise, it ain't happening because I know what's gonna happen after. It's gonna cost me. Right? Fun stuff. Yes, fun stuff. So what are the security implications? Now we know there is a partnership here, right? It's supposed to be. Mm -hmm. it's, it, it's an unusual partnership. It's a very unusual partnership. And in the beginning, during the bid design, everybody's happy because everybody's, you know, we want to win this project and, and you know, we're going to get this, we're going to work together, you know. Our ideas as consultants are put together with the contractor's ideas and we put a bid together, right? So during the bid, it's generally pretty good. Like the relationship is not bad. It's actually pretty good. It's after the fact. They forget about that partnership part. The key thing here, really, in our opinion anyway, is that the consultant has very little power in this relationship. Okay. So something even as basic as priorities, you know, consultant has certain priorities, contractor has other priorities. Those priorities many times don't, don't match. We, for example, as security consultants, want to do a design that meets the SOR, it meets best practice, all that sort of stuff. The contractor wants to save money. Right? And then there's a risk. 
Because if that's how it goes as a bid design, and then later the client says, your design doesn't meet our requirements, and, then, then, and the, these aren't changes the client's going to pay for. These are changes that Project Co has to eat, basically. Right? So on the specification side, typically a contractor might have an, a, a, a relationship or even sometimes a certification with a particular type of product with a particular manufacturer. So if I as a consultant felt that that product isn't actually going to do the job that I think needs to be done, my hands are tied because that subcontractor, that integrator, already has a contract in place with the CJV, right, the construction joint venture, and we're stuck with that contractor. And if, if their product is ABC product and we think ABC isn't really going to work because of whatever reasons, it's not the right product, we're kind of stuck. So again, you know, the power is not with us as consultants, right? Um, in some aspects, in some projects, you know, for example, in a, in a um, design bid build, Government many times does not want something hard spec, right? They want it open spec so that, you know, to make sure that it's fair and everybody can, can price or whatever. You don't want to like name a manufacturer and then another manufacturer will complain that hey, this is a government, this is a, a public, a, a, like a public project. Meanwhile, it's hard spec, you know, for something. So in a P3, that, that doesn't happen because it's not the government that's really um, uh, paying or choosing that product. It's that team project co, so they can hard spec, no problem. Nobody's is going to ask any any questions because it's a it's a private entity basically, right? Uh, interface issues. So when we're stuck with a certain system with a certain manufacturer, and you know some security system might need to interface with I don't know BAS or with whatever some other system. Some systems will interface a lot easier than others, right? So under, say, a, a design bit build, we might choose between ourselves and, say, mechanical or electrical or whatnot. We might try to choose products that make that integration a bit easier. We can't really do that in a P3 because the mechanical contractor will have picked whatever products, right? And the integrator is going to pick whatever, the security uh, integrator is going to pick whatever products. Sometimes they don't really integrate particularly well, so, so it makes that integration a bit more difficult. But uh, it can still happen, but sometimes things have to be done, either some piece of software that has to be, you know, prepared to sort out that, that integration. Uh, so certain things need to be done to make sure that that, uh, that that can happen. This is one that most people wouldn't think is a problem, but this is, this is, a, this is a nasty problem. Stakeholder turnover. So take, a, again, a government agency where there is a technical specialist that attends meetings. And even though he or she may not verbally say whether something's OK or not, but through the, architectural, through, the, through the architects and the engineers that are on their side, they will effectively kind of approve a design, right? Except six months or eight months or 12 months into the project, we're like 80% you know, into the design. That person gets moved off, shuffled off to some other department, and some other smart Alex shows up. And he or she doesn't agree with whatever aspect of we, what we are about to finish. Guess what? We're not going to get approval until we meet whatever this person's aspirations are. As long as they are not going significantly beyond the SOR requirements, they can say, you're not meeting the SOR, you've got to fix it, even though the previous person said, yeah, that's, that's what we want. That's what the SOR says. We're in agreement with you, right? And you can dig up all the meeting minutes you want. Yeah. <laughs> Not going to help. The SOR is the yeah. end all be all. Yeah. So bid phase versus execution phase. This is where the problems start to happen between uh, Project Co and the government and then within Project Co, right? Within the design and construction side. And that is during the bid when we prepare a set of drawings, right, that shows, for the sake of argument, 200 cameras on this campus, right? Um, during that bid and even during the negotiation, the government isn't going to say, yeah, we don't think you have enough cameras. You need like 50 more because we think you need cameras around the perimeter or you need cameras wherever, right? They, they're, they're not going to tell us that. They, they will only tell us that after we sign the contract. There, and, there, and, and there's no more money coming, 
right? It's when they start to review the drawings. They say, yeah, you have a hole here. You need to add like 30 cameras over there at that corner of the property or something, right? And of course, what pressure is, is, is going to happen is the pressure between the consultant and the contractor, even though we're on the same team, is going to start to come to the surface, right? Because the contractor is going to say, you should have known better, right? How come you didn't see that you needed 30 cameras? Well, the SOR didn't specifically say that that corner of the property needed cameras. Besides, you and I were working on it. You, you agreed with our design, 200, 200 cameras would do, right? Sometimes on the, on the flip side, the contractor might say, I want to cover two doors with one camera. I want a camera over there, and I want to cover, ca cover both doors. Even though I might say, I want a camera per door, because that's kind of what I think the SOR really wants. But if the contractor says put one camera, chances are that's how it's going to go. So the bid goes that way. But then the client eventually, once the execution starts, right, the, the construction and design, they, they yes, once the execution starts, uh, the execution phase, uh, the client will say, that's not what we want. We want a camera per door, right? So even though there was the contractor who started that ball rolling of decreasing number of cameras, they're still going to blame us. No, even though your contractor is going to have some sort of contingency fund, they should have that covered, yet they want to cut the cost down. So they're not going to tell you that we actually have it covered. They're going to just point the finger right at you and ask you, why didn't you cover it in the first place? And then there's the other aspect to this, which is the uh, variation directive, that document that I talked about very, very early on, right? It's the, it's, it, it pushes whatever they want through that door, whether you like it or not. So if there's some sort of change in, in the project that somebody in the government decided, hey, we forgot X, Y, Z, right? If they can't find some clause in the SOR that says, you know, something like, um, uh, you need to supply this, this, and this, but not limited to or whatever. That's an open clause. That's like, that's like the worst disaster waiting to happen. Because they can use clauses like that to tell you, that's great, so you're providing a projector and a screen and you're providing lighting. Yeah, we want automated lighting. Like we want some fancy schmancy system. Even though it doesn't clearly say it, right? But they'll try to read into it and try to, you know. But what they can do is force you through this VD, through this variation directive, is force you to proceed, even though we say it's going to cost more money, and they will say, we will negotiate at the end, we'll figure out the pricing later, but we can't delay, we, you need to proceed, they're going to write this variation directive, and off we go, we can't stop, we got to go. So what happens in the end? Yeah. They'll just go right back to the SOR and tell you that was never a part of the SOR. Yeah. It, that has happened on one of my projects for a change worth one and a half million dollars. The government said, we're not paying it, you should have known better. Can you imagine a contractor eating a million and a half bucks? That's, that's not a couple of dollars. <laughs> that's. So there is some liability, obviously, for, for poor, poorly done design, right, for consultants. Um, but it's a bit of a gray line because of this partnership between the consultants and, and, and the contractors, and we're trying to push the contractor to a better design, contractors trying to push things to a lower cost, right? So it's, it's, it is somewhat problematic, uh, especially if eventually, you know, the, the facility is built and somebody gets hurt or, God forbid, dies, you know, somebody might start to ask questions. Why was the design done this way? Why, is it, why wasn't it done that way? And you can end up, you can end up with, some, with some issues to deal with at some point, like long after the construction is done. So this is an example of a project that Philip and I did where we wanted, based on our interpretation of the SOR, to put access control at every one of these doors, or most of them, maybe not all of them, but, but, but certainly most of them. The contractor said, I don't want that. I want just at the two or three entry points, because that will secure the rest of this, of this space. It might secure the rest of the space from the from you know, the people that, are, that will work in here from the outside of that space, but it won't secure it between them, right? If there's third parties in there that you don't want to have access between spaces, then you won't have a way to track who's going in and out of, of rooms or if a door has been broken into in the middle of the night or something, right? So this is an example of uh, an actual project Philip and I did where we were effectively forced to, by the, during the bid, um, not add access control to doors, and we just added them at the perimeter of that, of that space. Because from a security standpoint, you have to figure out 
operationally, what are you trying to do in this space? The contractor doesn't really care. They just want to make sure, am I going to buy 10 card readers or am I just going to buy three? They're going to make you buy three. It's, it's, it's a cost issue. Yeah. Don't your room templates help like that? I beg your pardon? Don't the room templates that you have to do so sometimes the room data sheets will, will um, hi Ray, welcome. Um, sometimes the room data sheets or the space data sheets as some people call them, will indicate. But yet the contractor might choose to interpret that in a different way. And during the bid, all bets are off because chances are the government agency isn't really gonna review things in detail. They're gonna start reviewing in detail later on. So who? <laughs> yeah, I didn't know how to spell it. You know, I didn't know how to spell it. It. If my team leader came to me and asked me to write the SOR for, say, distributed antenna systems, as a professional, my job would be, sorry, can't help you. I know you're my boss. You pay me but I'm not an expert in distributed antenna systems. That's what I should be saying. Not everybody does that. So you have people writing a statement of requirements for multi-million dollar, hundreds of million dollar projects for things that they shouldn't be writing because it's not their expertise. We've had a project, it's not security related, but we had a project where somebody described the requirements for cellular service inside a, an enclosed sports venue, right? So make sure that all the attendees in the sports venue could get cellular coverage and proper signal. And they describe that requirement in literally two phrases. Cellular systems are not that simple. You need to describe throughput. You need to describe how many users are expected to be on there. How are you gonna connect to the, to the providers outside? Like there's all kinds of things. Two phrases, one little tiny paragraph does not make that happen, right? So these are some of the problems with, with this SOR business, right? So that's the punchline right there, right? So let me give you an example. Uh, again, this is not a security related one, but it will tell you, and this is a real true example that happened. Philip was actually not in this meeting. It was one of my projects, before, I think before Philip. One letter, one letter saved Project Co from a lot of money, one letter. So in a meeting, the government, not even the engineering and, uh, and, and architectural uh, side, it was actually the actual government person said, you need to provide, you Project Co need to provide a primary and secondary duct bank from the street, from every single service provider that is around this sports venue. And I, I happen to have my because I was leading the meeting, I had my, uh, my laptop connected to the screen. I flipped open the SOR and I read it to him. Project Co shall provide a primary and secondary incoming circuit stuck bank for use by the owner service provider, not providers. That one letter and knowing the SOR inside out, because after many months of reading through it and being shot at and hit with it over the head, you end up memorizing many things and I knew I was right. I simply wanted to put it up on the screen for him to read and the conversation ended. Yeah. I gave him an option though. I remember doing that. I gave him an option. I said, if you'd like, what we can do is give you one duct bank for each one of two ser service providers. So no redundant duct bank. I don't, I don't remember anymore what the contractor ended up doing or if they got a change or not, but that's how it stayed from the consulting side, right? So one letter, one letter can make a difference. But like we said earlier, the SOR is the end all be all. So Fernando looked at it carefully, that one letter that was missing. In this case, it saved us rather than, than the government. Here's another one. This is, I beg your pardon? Oh God, no, you think the contractor paid me lunch? Not a chance, not a chance. No, no. <laughs> so here's another example. So this is a, this is a way for the government entity to ask for something without outright saying what it is. So this is all the details of a particular cable they wanted. 
like everything's there, right? Pretty, pretty, you know, I mean, look at that. 58 picofarads per foot. It's pretty detailed. 30 picofarads per foot. Like, seriously? You know how long it took us to figure out which cable this was? <laughs> There's no name. No manufacturer, no part number. Contractor kept sending me shop drawings. I looked at it, it's not quite 58 or 30. <laughs> this is gonna work. Eventually, in a meeting with the, with the government, we said, in your documents, this is what we have, but we've been trying to find this cable and we can't find it anywhere. They didn't write it down, but they told me the manufacturer. And sure enough, it was some obscure manufacturer. I can't even remember to tell you which one it was. Honest to God, I can't even tell you. This is real deal. So the government document stated a cable type without saying the manufacturer or the part number. Because that, for some, whatever reason, that's exactly the one they wanted. I don't know if their buddy worked there or something. I have no idea. I don't, I don't have a clue. Yeah, maybe, maybe. So here's a couple of ones. These are security, security related. How, how vague is that? Project Co shall provide a state-of-the-art video surveillance storage. What the heck does state-of-the-art mean? These are not the types of clauses that help a project. These are not the types of clauses that, that instill a sense of confidence in the contractors and consultants who are on the project co side to make sure we're actually going to deliver something that's going to make the client happy and we're going to walk away and say, we're done, right? Using words like as required. Yeah, project co shall provide video surveillance storage <laughs> as required to meet client needs. <laughs> Is that 10 days worth of storage? Is it 30? Is it six months? Like, what the heck do you want? <laughs> if they've been asked to do a design that will cover for 30 years, what can they do but be very general? Well, what they could do is they could, they could say, rather than say storage, they could say, we want to store uh, every actual event, time-stamped event, for a number of seconds before and after the event, and we want that stored for, say, 30 days. After that, you can start recording over it, right? So that, like that, you don't have a quantity. You don't have to say 80 gigabytes or one terabyte or whatever, because that will depend on the number of cameras, how many days you're gonna get storage. But if they give some sort of sense of what it is that they want, at least we can design to it. This is completely vague. It leaves it completely open. Yes, sir? So for, and then on a case like that, where you don't have that guidance, would you be so bold as a consultant to do something that was sort of generally accepted best practice, average client, like 30 days and such and such a frame rate because it's reasonable? Or would you not take that leap and somehow try to force the issue in the process? So there's a couple of different things that you can do. One is definitely at one of the meetings where the client is, is, is put them on the spot. Ask them, like, what are you looking for, right? But during the bid, typically, they, they, they are very reluctant to answer. Because if they give you a value and don't make it known to the other bidders, that's not fair, right? So they either have to give you a, some, some sort of information and then they gotta share it with everybody else or they're gonna zip it and not say anything and then you're still stuck. But they're certainly willing to say it after the contract is signed, right? After the contract's signed, they're so willing to tell us how much they want. Wouldn't, wouldn't you just say I, again, so if you want an advantage, so, so this is a game, right? During the bid, this is a complete game. You want the advantage. You want, to, you, you want your cost to be as low as possible. So the contractors, together with us, will decide what is worth the risk and what is not, right? So take this example of the, of the quantity of storage, right? It's a perfect example. The contractor might choose to um, uh, make an assumption with us and say, okay, we're gonna assume that the client is gonna be happy with 15 days, let's say. So they might choose to do that because in the grand scheme of things, the value of it, even if it has to be a little bit higher, it might be worth their risk, right? Because they want the price to be as low as possible. So what you're saying in the response, you're, you're providing an exception, providing clarification to what you're Yes. Yes. Yeah. Or you just don't want to expose we'll your competition. That, that's, that, that, it's because of exactly that. If, you, if, it, if you're not exposing this, then the owner can come back and say, you have to meet our needs. If you're submitting an RFI, you're asking for clarification, but to your point, you want to 
be able to go in on the low side, so you're going to make an assumption. My question to you is, are you then having the assumption ri written as an exclusion or as an assumption in the pricing model that you're projecting? Assumptions in a P3 don't mean anything. Nothing. We've been involved in projects where, um, where the contractor and us, uh, for example, take, back, take that cellular example again. We actually told the client during bid and after, after we won the project, the cellular providers in the Toronto area will actually do it for free. They'll even pay you rent to have that equipment in your building. They will even update the equipment as the technology evolves. And simply because in the SOR it says, thou shalt provide a cellular system inside the venue, they held on to that for dear life because they wanted us to pay through the nose to have the system in. We had an assumption in our bid that said, we will not be doing the cellular system because we know that Bell, Canada, or TELUS, or Rogers will actually do it for free and pay you rent. During the bid negotiation, we said we will not, we, you know, we, we, we know that, it, that, that uh, Bell will do it or Rogers or whatnot. And the, the client during the bid, during the bid, the final contract negotiation said, we want that clause in there that you have to install it. We couldn't get rid of that clause. An assumption, assumptions in P3 are, are very difficult to, to, to deal with. Like chances are the, the government isn't going to be, um, willing to give anything up if they know it's going to save Projeco a dollar. It's, the, uh, it's really, really weird in that way. But then you're, you're going to need to go back to the stakeholders for a sec as well. You are mentioning about issuing RFIs. Any, as the SME, as the security consultant, you're going to want to pursue the best practices based on that clause. Make your assumptions, pursue it, write that RFI, and try to get the client to respond to it. It has to go through the CJV. Their priorities are different than what you might expect to be best practice for this type of clause. So if they deem it as, I don't think it's worth issuing an RFI because we're going to accept it and we want you to make sure, do what's best for the cost, then they might not issue it, even though we as the SME stated, best practice indicates that we need this. And there are two different types of RFIs we can issue, actually, in a P3. A confidential one, where the other teams don't know about it, right? This is during the bid design, right? So a confidential RFI, the other, team, the other teams will never know about that RFI or, or what the answer is. And the other one is an open RFI. So that's another game we play. If we think that the answer is something more expensive, of course, we don't want to make it confidential because we want the other teams to know that this piece that's more expensive is actually needed, right? But if it's something we think is going to save us money, we want it as confidential. But there have been times, in fact, well, I, I can't name the project, but recently, in the last year, we worked on a bid. It hasn't been awarded yet, so we don't know if we won. But we worked on a bid where every time our team suggested something that would save money in a confidential RFI, they would reply back, not accepted. But then on the next version, because as the, as the progress, this is a month, right, of, of bid design. On the next version of the SOR, because once in a while if they catch a flaw, if they catch a problem, they'll update the SOR and issue a new revision. That more than once on this one project, the client, the city, in this case it was the city, revised the, R, the, the SOR with that money-saving idea we had. Even though they declined to, to agree with it, because we, went, we put it as a, as, as a confidential RFI, they didn't say yay or nay. They just rejected to answer because it was confidential. Next thing you know, it shows up on the SOR. So much for trying to save ourselves some money and potentially winning the project. I mean, that's, it's, it's unfair. I mean, there's no other, there's no other way to, 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 to explain it. It's simply an unfair way to deal with it, right? Yeah, yeah, without describing the project itself, this was a major headache. We've been chasing them down with RFIs for months, asking them for these type of requirements. They don't respond to it. They just reject it but they just keep releasing additional SORs with what we were asking for. Yeah. Yes. So I'm sorry, your, your experience based similar to what you're describing there, what do you do when the owners or the stakeholders issue a request that you know may not meet a requirement, maybe a, maybe a 
some sort of a governing requirement or mm -hmm. something else so that the so that they can't come back to you even though they're asking for something maybe they have a requirement that they need to hold on to something for 90 days right but but they're asking for 30 what do you do to protect yourself from saying well we as subject matter experts certainly do not agree with this we recognize that this is a, this may be a 90 day requirement even though you're requesting 30 how do you protect yourself because you yeah. have no authority yeah. later in the process for them saying, hey, you as subject matter yeah. experts should have known to, to fight harder? It, it, it's very difficult. It's, it's very difficult to protect yourself from the government, from the, from the, gover to, for, from the, uh, uh, the public entity because um, the only document that is a legally binding document is the SOR and the contract that re that's revolved around it. That's the only document. Our RFIs, minutes of meetings, none of that matters until somebody makes a change to the SOR and they submit it as a new version. Nothing else matters. That's really your only option there is if you can get them to change it into yeah. the SOR, it, then you... It, so yeah. we, 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 have, we have rejected some requests until they put it into the SOR. We've, we've, we've done that. I had the good fortune of being on the PSAW side with the owner on three projects. It's the best the, place to be. And the disaster would be on one project that I finally left. Um, but you're exactly correct. And the problem is there's so much ambiguity. And um, when you get in that battle, there's really nobody to support you because the architect is watching out for their butt. That's right. And you're, we are on the, the lower yeah. food chain. Yeah. And um, it gets messy. It does. And then yeah. we had a project in building now. Everybody on the architecture firm quit. I mean, literally everybody left, so there was no way that was confirming what was yeah, said, yeah, done, yeah, written, yeah, or anything. Yeah, yeah, and that's yeah, a, yeah. that's a great yeah. place. Yeah. We finally said we're done, yeah, and lost yeah. considerable funds. But yeah. it was it could have been worse. Sorry, you had a question. Yeah. So, what precedent takes place that the SOR is the only document that is enforceable? Because best practices in the A&E community is that RFIs and responses are official documented information that can be enforced in litigation. I, I understand that, except one of the key lines in the SOR is that no other document is valid other than the SOR. That closes it. Right? That means the only way to, ha to have a change made is if they change the SOR, if they make a variation to, to the SOR. Do you know if that's actually been um, tried in litigation? And the I reason, don't know. The reason I, I ask I that know. is that that there requires the acceptance of so much risk in, in clarity of an SOR. So as the SOR has uh, a statement that is not clear and the ramifications are Potentially millions. Yep. It could be yep. in monetary value. Yep. Um, it, it is something that would really be a discouragement to participating in any type of. Uh, well, project. since you talked about discouragement, two of Canada's biggest firms are rumored to uh, just recently um, they're starting to entertain the idea of not bidding on P3s anymore be because the risk to them. The times that they've lost money, the times that, if, that they've had to go into either mediation or in the extreme case, litigation, it's, it, it's costing them too much money. Because you're trying it's, to bid on a new project and I don't know where you're still fighting battles from the project that you right. did five years that's ago. That's right. And the same government entity that is kind of nailing into the wall, I was going to use not a, very, not a very nice word, but as nailing into the wall on some other project is asking you to bid on another one. <laughs> like, really? Correct. Right. Absolutely they correct. Seen the end of correct. This train yet. correct. Absolutely. This this is one of the most horrible things. And frankly, I'll be honest with you, we 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 all we all write this. I've I've written it. But in a P3, this is deadly. <laughs> this can cost you a fortune, right? But not limited to. It's a way for a, the consultant who's writing the SOR. I probably forgot something, so I'm just going to try. But not limited to. You know, I'm in a hurry. I got to write this down, so I can't remember all the things I need to write. So I'm going to say, but not limited to. In a P3, it's 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 nasty. So the success of the project is on the honesty and the technical competence of both sides of the project. We talked about writing a crappy SOR. How can you deliver a successful project when you can't even have requirements that are very 
well written. At the same time, if you're on the other side, you're on the private side, if you don't have the competency to deliver the project, it doesn't matter how well your SOR is written, you're still not going to have a successful project. And this ties into the next topic. What about cyber? Now you're going to look at that. That spelling is not a mistake. That spelling is not a mistake. That, is, ahead, not, that is not the Canadian spelling of cyber. <laughs> there is a story to this. So there was one project we are sort of tying into, not really where we were discussing about cyber to the contractor. Now, someone on the contracting side was writing up minutes for it, and it was displayed on the screen. So it was kind of verbatim, not verbatim, so they were typing it out. Something, something, something about cyber requirements must be met, and it was displayed on the screen to everyone in the room. Well, what do you think they typed out? Cyber. Who doesn't know how to spell cyber? Clearly not that. It's, it's, it's an indication of how um, lacking, how lacking in the technical knowledge and ability in different systems, be it in security or, or even mechanical, like whatever, you know, if you don't have the right person doing the job, you're going to end up with, at the very least, spelling errors, <laughs> at the very least, and that'd be the least of the problems. Let's talk about the other side for a sec again, the SOR. Project Coach shall design a system with considerations for cybersecurity. This is an actual line from, a, from a, uh, an SOR. This is the only line there in was the a sec SOR. Section for cybersecurity, one sentence, that's it. Yes, one line. What is that supposed to mean? You consider it, but as the contractor, how are you going to put a monetary value to, to a you statement can't. like that? Yeah, so we're, we're, we're not going to have a whole lot of time to talk much about cyber, sadly, because we want to talk about, oh, that's, that's, that's another funny one, right? That's our CIO, he's encrypted for security purposes. Anyways. Um, so how do we protect ourselves as consultants? How do we, you know, there's, there are certain things that, that we can do. And as much as, you know, I've said minutes of meetings, for example, um, aren't really worth the paper they're written on from the government's perspective. But minutes of meetings between, especially during, for example, a bid design, but really through the entire thing, between the, the, the stakeholders within Project Call. Nobody, is your friend if you're a consultant. Nobody. You, you, you can't think that just because I have a nice relationship during the bid design with this contractor, that once we win the project and they figure out that the client, the ultimate owner wants another 50 cameras, they, they can't point the finger at the government. The contractor cannot point the finger at, at, at the government. It's not the government's fault. So who are they going to point the finger at? Even though they were ultimately intimately involved in the design of the project, they're going to turn the finger to, to, the, to the consultant. With and all intentions, it's there, right? You, at the beginning of the project, everyone sits in a room. All right, guys, let's work together for the greater good of the community and deliver a successful project. Down the road in the project, what happens? Yeah. So what are some of the things that we can do? We have to make sure the right people are in place, right? The people that have the technical knowledge that, that can actually write or design the systems that are needed, right? Don't put somebody like me designing DAS. You're asking for a disaster, right? Or you're asking for like a one-liner in, in, in an SOR, right? So you as a security consultant, doesn't matter if you're working on the private side or the public side, make sure you have that expertise yeah. and that competence yeah. before you pursue the project. So if you're, if you're working for the owner and you're writing the SOR, if you don't want, don't want me to be your worst nightmare during the bid design and especially during execution, then don't write one line sentences for cyber or for something else because I've made some people's lives very, very difficult in, in some very long meetings because the SORs are poorly written. And as much as I don't like to criticize other consultants, it's not appropriate, but there's no choice. Sometimes you have to say, you didn't write that, so why are we providing it? Right? Decision log. This is really important. Um, the, again, the, in this case, again, this is within Project Co, not government. Government does not care about any of this. But if you can document that the contractor said, put one camera in the corner to cover two doors, and you put the name of the person, you put you know, whatever details, it was via email, it was in a meeting, it was a whatever, and you keep this log, it's going to help you when at some point the government says, one camera won't do, I want a camera per door, at least between us, when it comes to litigation or mediation, I have a piece of paper that says it was the contractor who told me to do it, even though I said not to. 
and, I, and, and, and here's my evidence, right? So a detailed, a detailed decision log, yeah. Um, a change log, so anybody who wants changes, right? Same idea. Responsibility matrix, I'll show you what that looks like in the next slide. Minutes of meetings, again. Internal, forget about government. Like it's, you still do minutes with government, with meetings with government agencies, but you know. Standardized documents, right? Make sure your documents actually, uh, you know, are industry standard that show, you know, proper design, proper, proper text. <laughs> and for God's sake, archive every email. And last but not least, some projects use an offsite document management system like Aconex. As consultants, typically we don't own that as the contractor. Before that door gets shut, download everything off of that Aconex account so you have a copy of it. Right? You, th you think you have the upper hand until you realize some of the documents are missing and yeah. you don't have opportunity. So this is an example of a responsibility matrix where uh, we might list different parts of a system, right? Network switches, servers, integration engine, cable pathways, and so on and so on. And we note who's responsible, right? Who's, 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 that, who's gonna deliver that network switch? Is it Project Co or is it the client side, right? So that's an example of, so that's for every system, everything, security, comms, like you name it, okay? Everything. Say so it's a way to protect yourself so everybody knows who's doing what. And then we add these two very nice clauses in our drawings during bid, during bid. Statement of requirements, project, pro project agreement, and request for proposal, complete with appendices, latest version, whether specifically indicated on the drawings or not, must form part of these drawings for this project. So that's a, a clause that the contractor will read and it tells them, don't just look at my drawings, <laughs> you gotta read all that other stuff too, because it's part of these drawings for your bid, right? And the second statement we put on, these drawings must not be considered as the sole source of information for the purpose of, the, of determining or establishing a bid price for the project. The latest version of the SORP and RFP and all appendices and additional information as provided by others must be reviewed, used and followed in conjunction with these drawings to establish all requirements and, de and determining a bid price for the work. Again, don't just count on the drawings as a contractor, right? So, yeah. Yeah. so while a lot of them point, try to point fingers at you, you also have to make sure we're all a part of the same team. So you have to make sure the contractors also have the due diligence to cover their part, which is why we have those type of clauses. Yeah. Thank you. Sorry, we ran about three minutes late. Apologies for that. Any other questions, any comments? He said on your, on your disclaimer that you, you put in there, include but not have to do. I know, I know. I told you, I do it myself. I do it myself, I told you that. We right. have a request for the client afterwards to edit their conversation. $10,000 for an intercom because of 30 years, replacing it three times, the painter, the box guy, that's right. the that's wallpaper. Right. The that's right. I thought, that's what? right. Yeah. But that's what the cost was. That's right. Is there a reason why you didn't put the date of the SOR that you used during the bid process? Uh, because during the bid design, these two clauses show up fairly early on, so it gives the contractor some food for thought. Um, uh, and uh, the SOR gets updated through that entire bid design. Yeah. So by us, by saying the latest version, if the day before the bid closes, the city or the state or the province decide we need to issue an SOR to fix God knows what, we're still covered. We don't have to worry about whether the date is shown or anything like that. We just say the latest version of the RFP, the SOR, and the, and the, and the project agreement. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. And you got to keep updating it. So by saying the latest version, then... Because then we already had an example where the project was supposed to be submitted, let's say, in July. They just keep extending and extending and extending it. On the week of the actual deadline, they've issued three different versions of the SOR still. Yeah. yeah. So just out of curiosity, when we tend to write specifications, we use language. But there, you didn't say something like, what will take precedence over the other. You didn't say scope of no, because the SOR shall take precedence over drawing. No, because because you see the SOR, the project agreement, and the RFP are the documents that came from the government side, right? And all I'm saying to the contractor, my buddy, <laughs> my friend, is my design is a 30% design, right? We have to keep that in mind. My design is a 30% design, only enough to give you an idea what we think the design is roughly gonna be like. 
So if they're going to roughly price a 30% design, they're probably going to miss costs for a bunch of other things, right? I mean, a 30% design is missing all kinds of details, all kinds of information. We have a general idea of how many cameras where they're going to go, how we're going to run the cabling, you know, all this sort of stuff. But it's still only roughly 30%. But by us telling them, Mr. Contractor, I know you're my friend and everything, but I'm not the only one who should be reading the SOR. I'm not the only one who should be reading the, the project agreement. And I'm not the only one who should be reading the RFP. You also need to read it. You also need to understand it to make sure that in your costing, you don't just look at my drawings and some, maybe some preliminary specs and products, but you're also going to look at all those other documents. You didn't say shall take precedence. No, because it can't. I don't want precedent. I want the whole thing taken as in one picture. Right? Because one thing is a set of documents from the government that says this is the, what the project needs to be like. And the other one is my interpretation or our interpretation of those documents, right? So they need to take the whole thing into account. There, in my view, there shouldn't be a precedence there. You have, a you have various amounts of documents that form a part of the entire. Yeah. By the way, I mean, an SOR, we're talking about the one we did for recently that we don't know yeah. the answer if we won yet. Yeah. It was over a thousand pages, right, or a couple of thousand yeah. pages in an yeah. SOR. I mean, we're talking about like a massive document. Of course, only a sliver of it is technology or security or whatnot, right? A lot of it is architecture, a lot of it is mechanical or whatnot, right? Uh, but still, it's uh, it's a significant document. You can think that you legitimately have a change order for yeah, additional yeah. services, and it took us six months to even get a, a decision if what we did was additional services. Yeah. You expressed a lot of pain and suffering and the only <laughs> Sorry. thing that, well the only thing that i saw as an upside professionally was the fact that apparently this pain and suffering is endless so there's job security <laughs> <laughs> corporately speaking though do you feel like your company makes money on these projects and they're worthy to pursue I, that, that, yeah. so it 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 it's a it's a it's a difficult it's a it's a difficult issue, right? Because Arab Arab is very well known for massive projects, right? We we don't and I don't mean this I don't mean this with any kind of disrespect, but we don't do Home Depot stores. We don't do Walmart. Cause they all look the same. We don't we don't we don't we do, we we do one of a kind, very difficult jobs, because that's what keeps us challenged. That's what keeps us interested in projects. So. For us not to get involved in P3s uh, would really take a significant chunk out of the business. So what we try to do is we do our best to protect ourselves from our friends right? by documenting the living heck out of everything if, as much as we can. Because the problem is that it's not a question of whether they will have a claim against us. That's not the question. The question is on what and by how much, right? And will the insurance that we have cover our claim if it's a, if it's a, a valid claim? But, but before we even get to the point of establishing whether the claim is valid and the insurance might have, uh, will bring in a person who's responsible for trying to mediate, right? Um, uh, what we do is we spend sometimes a significant amount of money to defend Right? We go research our emails, research our minutes of meetings, research our, our, um, um, our change log, our decision log. Right? And we try to put a story, literally a story together, as to why this change is actually not our fault. Right? Why did it cost more money? If it's not Arab's fault, we need to defend ourselves. And that's true for every other consultant that's involved in P3s. This is not an Arab story. This is a consulting story. Right? So it, it's not that it's not worth it. And yes, you can lose your shirt and your pants and your firstborn if you're not careful. But if you do a diligent job, not just in the project, but in documenting every step through the project, during the bid and in the execution of the project, uh, certainly, it will, you know, mitigate the chances of you losing your shirt, your pants, and your firstborn. But I think, and you one, might make a couple of bucks. But I think one of the reasons why we also take on all these projects is we are known to be innovative with trying to figure out how to design something, and we have that capability. We have that SME, so we're not afraid to take on that type of project because we know we can deliver. We have the expertise to deliver. So when you said when you said when, not if. 
when does that mean that you get lawyers involved when you're still doing your proposals? Mm, uh, well, certainly the lawyers review okay. review the document. Absolutely, no question. Um, but certainly the, the the heavy lifting of defending ourselves comes comes at the end. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. No. For sure. For sure. I mean, contra the, the lawyers are involved even at the contract signing, you know, like when you're reviewing the contract. So of course the, the contractor who's effectively our, our client, they're, they're, they're our client, we work for them, right? They are the ones who pay our bills. So they, um, you know, will have certain clauses in the contract and then we, you know, our lawyers will review and we don't agree with this clause. We're not gonna, you know, we're not gonna sign a contract if you have this clause on there, blah, you know? So yeah, it's a, it's, yeah, a lot of people get involved in, you know, but that's why you don't do a P3 with like a million dollar project, right? It's, it's got to be like really, really, really large projects. How often do you see sub consultants Oh, very, very often. Very often. Oh, absolutely. Or vice versa. We worked on, for example, that rail project that you saw, that maintenance facility project that Philip and I worked on, one of the first, like the last picture you saw, right? That project, we were actually a sub to another consultant who didn't have our specialty. So, or, or maybe didn't have the staff availability or something, but they came to us, to Arab, to help with the security and the comms design. Because it's part right. of the DJV. You have the architects and then you have all your consultants and designers. Yeah. If you hire on one firm and they don't have every single one of your specialties, yeah, all of, all of your specialties, then you sub that down to another person who does have that capability. Yeah. 